Okay, this is part 2C of my series on Lagoon Nebula without a star tracker. Uh, in this part, we're going to look at PixInsight, which is a paid program available on Linux, Windows, and Mac. I'm going to be using it on my Mac. I realize there is a newer version um, that includes StarNet, but I haven't updated it. I haven't updated that version yet because um, it doesn't work with the Mac operating system that I'm using, which is an older version of Mac OS. So just a personal thing, but if you do, if you are on like the latest Mac operating system, I would recommend uh, updating to the latest PixInsight version where StarNet is included and they've made some improvements too. But if you're like me and you're on an older version of PixInsight, you can always just uh, Google StarNet++ and download it from the SourceForge site and follow the instructions to get it working on your operating system. Um, it's right here under PixInsight module. Um, I did that. I'm on Mac OS 10.13 and uh, I have StarNet working just fine within PixInsight here under the processes. So uh, that's an option too. Okay, anyways, enough about setting this up. Um, we're going to be processing some uh, files of the Lagoon Nebula. This was done without a star tracker, just on a tripod. And I'm going to be use, using... Um, a script to do the processing, specifically the batch pre-processing script. Um, I have tried weighted batch pre-processing, which is sort of like the newer update of batch pre-processing. For me, it doesn't work so well because I, I usually have lots of problem files. And so uh, I don't, I haven't figured out a way to weight those appropriately. I need to do batch pre-processing with Calibrate only on and then look through my files in something like Subframe Selector or Blink before moving on to registration and integration. Um, so uh, this might work for some people, but I'm still on batch pre-processing. Um, I always, the first thing I do is turn on this Calibrate only. Um, I typically don't register or stack using this uh, because I don't know what my files look like yet. And so I like to look through them and make sure I'm stacking the best ones. Okay, um, it's pretty simple to use. You just add your lights, flats, bias, dark frames into these uh, tabs here, just using the buttons down here at the bottom. So I'll go ahead and do that. Everything is on my desktop here in this folder called Lagoon. And if you wanna follow along, um, you can download these files from my website. The link will be in the description. But basically I'm just selecting my files and adding them using the appropriate buttons here. So I'll just go ahead and speed this part up since it's a little boring. Okay, so I've added everything now. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to leave uh, most things on their default parameters. Um, for the most part, the defaults in batch preprocessing script are just fine. These are CFA images, meaning that they have a color filter array, um, specifically a Bayer array um, in front of the sensor. We're not using any master bias, master dark, master flat, but if you did have a master bias or something like that, you would just only add the master bias here and then just click this little checkbox next to use master bias in order to use that. Um, we're not gonna be doing any registration, so I don't have to add a registration reference image, but I do have to specify an output directory. So I'm just gonna make a new folder called BPP and save to that. And then we can go ahead and click run and uh, it will do its thing. It takes, it'll take a while because we're doing hundreds of frames. So uh, it has to create all those master uh, calibration files and then uh, calibrate all of our lights using those. So we'll get a little time here um, and then when it's all done, we'll, we'll move on to the next step. Okay, the batch preprocessing script uh, finished and I went ahead and closed out of it. Next up, we're gonna go to, to the process menu and go down to all processes, subframe selector. And I use this uh, process to determine which frames have the best focus. So finding a good registration uh, frame. And uh, it also will tell you if there's any frames that seem really odd and uh, you know out of whack. Um, so uh, 
I'm just gonna enter in a few little parameters here. Our subframe scale was around, I think, 17 arc seconds per pixel. Uh, I don't know our camera gain, so I'll just leave it on one. I'll change our camera resolution to 14 bit. And then I'm just gonna click up here where it says subframes. I'm gonna click on the add files button. And um, in the BPP folder, there's another folder called calibrated, then light, then debared. And so basically um, it creates logs, it creates masters of your calibration files, and then this calibrated folder is for where it actually calibrates your flats and your lights. We don't wanna use these ones because these are, are in black and white. Uh, we wanna use the debared ones where they're in full color. And then I'm just going to click and shift click to select all of these files and click open. Okay, and now I have 282 subframes um, ready to analyze. And so we're going to go ahead and analyze them or measure them um, using uh, this process. And uh, it, it does take a while. I'm gonna go ahead and start it just by hitting the little circle down here. And uh, you can see it, it starts over here. It does about uh, eight subframes at a time. Um, if for some reason you have to stop the process and then pick it back up, it does save it into memory. So uh, just I've, I've often had to like, it, it takes up a lot of your computing resource and your memory. So if for some reason you have to stop it and do something else, like some other work, uh, it's fine. You can always pause it and then come back later. Um, but it does take a while. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and cut the video here and then we'll see what it says when it's all done measuring. All right, the subframe selector finished analyzing my uh, frames here. I have uh, 282 lights that it analyzed. And um, the first thing we wanna look at is this measurements window. So bring that to the front. And don't pay too much attention to the actual numbers that I'm gonna be showing you because um, these are gonna be wildly different based on your conditions, your focal length, all kinds of things. The main thing that we're trying to do with this is just look for outliers. So obviously there's at least, or there is two outliers here in my 282 frames in terms of full width half maximum, which is a good uh, corollary to focus. So basically, uh, two frames are way, way out of focus and we should uh, get rid of those frames. Um, if I look at eccentricity, it's the same two frames that are way off. So, so obviously there's something wrong with those two frames. I'm guessing probably they were are when I moved the camera uh, to, re to reframe, uh, maybe it, it was still going or something, um, or they were just test frames when I was testing focus. So in any case, I wanna get rid of those and the other thing that I want to do with this script is find the, the, the frame that has the best focus. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just going to do that by sorting up here. So if I sort by, instead of sorting by index, which is just the number of frames uh, in order, I'm going to sort by FWHM, full width half maximum, and if I sort Ascending, that will give me, at the top here, the frame that has the best focus. So I'm just gonna write this down. It's image 1028. Um, there are ways that we could sort them and then output them um, and you know eliminate ones we don't want using these expressions and the output uh, option. I'm not gonna show that right now just because with so many frames, that's gonna to take too long and take up so much uh, space on my hard drive. So I'm not gonna use those features, but uh, maybe in another video, I can show how this expressions window works. So I'm just gonna write down, I wanna use 1028 when I do image registration, because that's the frame with best focus. Okay, then I'm going to sort FWHM, full width half maximum descending and from here, I can see that the two frames that I want to delete are 0904 and 1000. Yeah. The two frames that I want to delete are 0904, this one with the 
huge full width half maximum, and uh, number 1,000. So I'll just write those two down, 904, 1,000. And then all I'm gonna do is just um, go into my Lagoon folder, go into the batch preprocessing folder, calibrated, light, debayered, and just find 904. and delete it, and then find frame 1000. And delete that. Now it doesn't uh, show up here. This doesn't uh, this doesn't update live that I've gotten rid of those. But um, I know that those are the two frames that were huge outliers that were there were big problems. Just to double check, I can sort by eccentricity here. And yep, it's the same two ones, 904 and 1000. So getting rid of those um, has given me a nice uh, fresh start here uh, with all clean data. Um, and then the only other one that I am paying attention to here is 1028. That's the frame that I'm gonna use to register against. And just to double check that it's there's nothing wrong with that frame, I like to open it up and look at it. So you can just do file open Again, you're gonna go into that batch pre-processing, calibrated, light, debayered, and find it in here. One zero two eight, and open it up. Get this out of the way. I'll just apply apply an auto stretch to this. And zoom in a little bit. And yeah, this looks good. I don't see anything wrong with this frame. So uh, I'm gonna use this to register all of my lights to. So we can go ahead and move on to that. That's all that I'm gonna show in subframe selector today. Uh, maybe, again, maybe in other videos I can show more about it because it is a useful tool. And we're gonna go right on to image registration. So if you go to processes, image registration, and choose star alignment, this is a process that will let you automatically align using a reference image and match star patterns. So I'm gonna choose up here where it says reference image, I'm gonna switch it from view, meaning that would be if we had a view open, we could use that, but I already closed the image. So we're gonna choose file. And then I'm just going to pick that one that I just had open, 1028. Click open. Um, I'm gonna leave all of these settings alone. The only thing that I'm gonna change from the defaults is I'm gonna turn off generate drizzle data. That, that would take a long time if I left it on and I'm not gonna drizzle this data because it's not dithered. And then uh, where it says target images here, I'm just gonna click add files and pick everything left in my debayered folder since we deleted those two problem files. Okay, and then I'm gonna create an output directory, meaning just a folder. I'll put it just in my Lagoon folder and I'll call it uh, REG for registered. Okay, and that's it. Um, I usually just leave all of these other settings alone. The only time you would need to change them is if you were having issues. So for instance, if you were having issues with it not being able to find stars in your image, you could turn up or down the detection scales. You could change the noise scales, hot pixel removal, all these different things, sensitivity, um, to try to pick up more stars. Um, basically, uh, if you hover over any of these, they do tell you a bit about them and how you would use them. Um, but I think the defaults are gonna work for me, so I'm just gonna go ahead and leave all of those alone and just hit the circle icon down here to apply this process globally on all the target images. And this does take some time. Um, the more cores you have in your computer's CPU, the faster it will go, because um, it is a very multi-threaded process. Um, but uh, for my uh, 
five or six year old laptop here, it'll probably take, I don't know, an hour or something. Um, so I will just leave it alone and uh, come back when it's all done. Okay, it finished aligning all of our images uh, using the star alignment process. If I go over here and hover over process console, it uh, tells me that all 280 images succeeded, zero failed, zero skipped, and it took about 26 minutes. Um, okay, so next, uh, what we're gonna do is go ahead and close out of that. All of the files that we just aligned with star alignment are in that reg folder, and we'll open up another process called image integration. So I'm just gonna to go to the process menu, go down to image integration, and then image integration again. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and click this little uh, reset button down here in the lower right, just to make sure all the settings are the defaults. Then I'm gonna click add files, go into Lagoon, Reg, and select all the files in the registration folder. Click open. I'll just make sure that I have 280 here. I do. Then in the image integration tab, uh, I'm gonna open that. And the only thing that I am going to, then I'm gonna open the image integration tab. I'm not gonna change anything in here, but I just wanna show you these are all the settings that we wanna use, average noise evaluation, <clears throat> evaluate noise, you know, generate integrated image, all of these default settings are what we want. Under pixel rejection um, one, we want to change this. We don't want the rejection algorithm set to no rejection. That wouldn't be smart. What we want is to change it to Windsorized Sigma clipping. And what that will do is anything that are outliers, anything that aren't in the central part of the standard deviation, meaning hot pixels, any other kinds of noise, uh, will get thrown out uh, when we do the averaging. So we definitely wanna turn on a rejection algorithm. I would recommend turning on clip high range in addition to all of these other clipping options right here. Okay, with that set, I can go ahead and click the circle button down here to apply this globally, meaning that it's gonna apply it to all the frames in our input images list. And uh, there's no place to save them because what it's gonna do is after it uh, integrates all these images, it will create the image right here in the window um, and then we can keep working on it. So again, this is gonna take a little time, so I'm gonna speed up the video. Okay, that process is finished. Uh, we have the integrated file here. And uh, to see what it looks like, we can turn on an STF auto stretch. You can do that in one of two ways. You can either just hit the little radioactive button up here, or you can open up the process called screen transfer function, which gives you a few more options. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up the process. And what I wanna point out in screen transfer function is that normally the channels are linked meaning that it's gonna stretch all three equally. But if you unlink the channels, then it will apply different stretches to each channel and you'll get a better color balance um, in your preview. So I'm gonna go ahead and unlink the channels and then hit this radioactive uh, icon to auto stretch it. And that shows me what we have here. So you can see this is a nice wide field shot of the Milky Way. You can see there's some color balance issues on each uh, side where the signal to noise ratio goes down. There's also some registration artifacts down here at the bottom. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm actually just going to crop in on this picture um, so that we don't deal with these low, sig low signal, high noise areas on the sides and at the bottom. And to do that, I'm gonna go and open up the process called dynamic crop. If you go to process menu and go down to geometry, it's called dynamic crop. And it just works like any other crop tool. You can just uh, draw out a box here. Something like that. And then hit the green check mark to crop the image. Okay, that's done. Next thing I'm gonna do is apply a uh, dynamic background extraction to this. And so that's also under processes. It's the second option down, background modelization, and then dynamic background extraction. 
And you first want to click on the image and then just click into areas where you should have a fairly neutral um, black. So I'm mostly just going to sort of pick uh, areas here where there's either dark sky, like in this corner and this corner, or dark nebulae. Um, you don't want to click on, you know, anything bright or a star. You just want to pick the more neutral black parts of the image that could be considered background. And I'm just sort of trying to add them with some coverage. So getting each corner, getting each side and um, the middle. And usually about 10 or 12 uh, will do it. Um, you can see that this one down here is red and that means that it wouldn't be included if we tried to run this process now. Um, so what you can do to include that sample is increase the tolerance. So it's by default at 0.5. I'm just going to try to raise it to one. And then under sample generation, click resize all. And then you can see that sample down there changed from red to white, meaning it's now included. Okay, with that done, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the target image correction menu right down here and choose subtraction. And then hit the green check mark. What it then does is it creates a background model uh, using the samples that we just gave it to create a, a model of the background, which you can see right here looks a little funny if I don't up the bit depth. There we go. So this is the background model, and then we can see what the image looks like with that background model subtracted. Okay, good. I'm gonna go ahead and close that process. I'm gonna close the background model, and I'm just gonna put these pictures side by side so you can see what it did. So here's the before, and here's the after. And hopefully you can see on your screen that um, on this one, the sides especially look a bit washed out and like uh, low contrast. And in this one, because that background model was subtracted, it looks a lot better. So I'm just gonna minimize this one and we'll put it over to the side and we'll keep working on this one. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and save this just so we have uh, something to fall back to in case there's a program crash or something like that. I'll just save it to the desktop as an XISF file, which is the uh, default format in PixInsight. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, stretch this, but before I stretch it, I'm just gonna increase saturation just a little bit with the curves transformation. So I'm gonna open up curves. I'm gonna switch to the saturation mode, which is this S over here on the right, and just pick a spot about two thirds up on the curves line and just stretch that up like that and apply it just by hitting the square right here. Okay, and hopefully you can see that increase the saturation a little bit. I'm gonna keep this curves transformation open because I might wanna do it a couple times more as we're stretching the image. I'm then gonna take off the auto stretch. I'm gonna open up histogram transformation, which is under intensity transformations in the process menu. And I'm going to start stretching the image. So I'm going to open up, I'm going to say I want this to apply to integration underscore DBE. That's our background extracted image right here. And I'm going to take this middle slider and move it pretty far over to the left and then hit the square to apply. You can see even with that much stretch, we're just barely seeing some stars. So I'm going to apply it again. Okay, this time I'm going to do a little bit less of a stretch, something like that, and hit the square. Okay, now we can start seeing the image. And so I'm just gonna keep backing off the stretch just a little bit. And now we have enough breathing room here that I could take this shadow slider and just move that over a little bit to the right. You wanna be careful here, down here it tells you how many pixels you'd be clipping completely to black. And so right now it says I'd be clipping 172 pixels to black. I'm comfortable with that amount, but if it said like 
20,000 pixels are, are clipping to black, that would be way too much. And so I would, I would want to back off that uh, a little bit. Okay, I'm going to apply this. Actually, before I apply that last stretch, let's go ahead and just add some more saturation just by applying this saturation curve. Okay, cool. And then I'm going to apply the stretch. Perfect. Okay, and honestly, uh, you know, this is already looking really nice. Um, we might not really have to do much else to it. Uh, you might be happy with just that amount of processing in PixInsight. All we did was a background extraction, a crop, and a, and a stretch. Um, there are a few things, though, that I'm noticing that could be improved on. So I'm going to close these two processes. Uh, one is that we have a little bit of green noise over on this side of the picture. So I'm just going to try to run a noise reduction SCNR green. And I'm going to start it at something like 0.3 um, because I don't want to run it at full strength or it usually takes out too much green and screws up your color balance. But I'm just going to try to take out a little bit of that green noise. Okay. And I think that did a pretty good job. Um, here's the before. You can see this, this side of the picture especially really has this green cast to it. And there's after. And it looks a lot more naturalistic. Um, but we could try running it again if you think that it needs it. So you can always just apply it again. Okay, and it took out even more green. Here's the first. You can see it's really green on this side. Here's the first um, application of SCNR green, and here's the second application. And yeah. I think I like two applications, so I'm going to leave it like that. Okay. Um, the next thing we can do is um, remove the the stars from the image and um, boost the Milky Way a little bit, and then add the stars back in. Um, to do this, we use a process called StarNet++. If you have the latest version of PixInsight installed, it uh, comes with PixInsight now as a main process. Uh, you can always update to the latest version to get it. Um, personally, I'm on an older version just because of the age of my Mac, but for most people, you can just update to the latest version and get it that way. Okay, um, for a wide field image like this, I don't think the stride of 128 is going to do a very good job, so I would usually lower it to 32 or even 16. Let's try 32 and see how it does. So to apply it, all you do is uh, either just hit this apply button or drag the new instance icon onto your image and let go. And it does, of course, like everything in uh, processing, take a while, so we'll let it do its thing and catch up when it's done. Here's the result of the pixel math operation. It took 49 minutes with a stride of 32. One thing I forgot to do is make a copy, but we can always do that now. And then I'm just gonna undo the star removal on this one. So now we have a starless image and the image with stars. And let's just name them appropriately. So I'm just gonna type in stars there and double click on this tab and call this starless. And I'll go ahead and save these as well. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is on my starless image, I'm gonna apply some curves. So I'm gonna to go to Process, Intensity Transformation, Curves Transformation. And I'll leave this saturation one up like that, but I'm also gonna just do the RGBK and just do a slight S curve like this. And let's go ahead and hit the preview, the real time preview, to see what this looks like. Oh, and that's the real time preview of the star image. That's not what we want. So let's click on this one and then do the real time preview. And I think that's a little bit too much on the saturation. So I'm just going to edge off that a little bit. And I'm just going to add a little bit more shadow definition just by making this. S curve, 
just a little bit more extreme. Okay, let's go ahead and apply that. Okay, so here was the before, a little bit washed out, and here's the after, just a lot more um, extreme contrast. I think the it made the overall picture just a little bit too dark, but the thing is when we combine these two, the picture is gonna get a lot brighter, so that's fine for now. So I'm just gonna leave it like that. And um, let's go ahead and now combine the two images back together. And we're gonna do that with pixel math. Uh, so you can open up uh, pixel math just by going to process pixel math, pixel math. And we can use a single RGBK expression. What we wanna do, this is a little bit um, funky and I'm not gonna be able to explain it exactly what it's doing, but the tilde key, uh, which is under the escape key on your keyboard, it looks like a little sort of curved dash. That's an inversion of all the pixel values. So we wanna do tilde parentheses, tilde stars, times, which is the asterisk, tilde starless, end parentheses. Okay, let me, uh, okay, and what this is, is this is the equivalent of a screen blending mode in uh, Photoshop, um, but in PixInsight's pixel math. Um, so let's go ahead and see how that looks. Um, okay, so I have that typed in. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the destination tab and change it from replace target image, because I don't wanna do a replacement, to create new image. Um, and I want it in the RGB color space, and then I'm just gonna hit the square to apply. Okay. And we get this image. And hopefully you can see, other than just being brighter than our original image, it also made these nebulae pop out a bit more. Um, and a lot of the dust, the dark lanes in the, the Milky Way as well. Um, to make those uh, dark areas of the Milky Way pop even more, there's actually a script in, in PixInsight. It's under the script menu up here. And it's under utilities. And it's called dark structure enhanced script. So let's try running that as well on our new image five. I'll just hit okay. Okay, so this is the before, and that's the after. You can just see that the, the dark dust lanes throughout the Milky Way got a little bit enhanced through that. Um, the next thing we wanna do though is um, reset the black point on this image, and we can do that again with curves. So I'm gonna open up curves transformation again reset it and open up a real-time preview. And then I'm just going to drag down here over in the shadows area. Okay, so now we can see what um, the starless boost did to the image. Hopefully you can see that it's, it's pretty subtle, but um, it definitely boosted up the, the nebular regions a little bit. Um, and I think sort of improve just sort of the drabness of this one um, by making it a little bit punchier. Um, we can also zoom in on some feature and see how it looks. Okay, so there's our Lagoon and Triffid. I'm just gonna apply that same view over here to the just stars image. And hopefully you can see in this view that it, it just, um, it minimizes the sort of the um, dominance of the star field a little bit and makes the nebulae, I think, pop out a little bit more and, and appear just a, a little bit punchier. Um, let's look at another feature here. So here's the star cloud in our new one, and here it is in the old one. And so it still looks like a really beautiful star cloud, but it just, I think it just looks a little bit uh, more refined over this on this one. And then here's the omega and the eagle. And again, I just think they pop out a bit more um, in this one. But basically, I'd be I'd be happy with either image. So if for some reason Starnet uh, isn't working for you, I think uh, 
I think this looks just fine, but this just looks a little bit more finished to me. Okay, and then for saving, um, we can always save it as a PixInsight file. So I could just call it Lagoon PI Final. You can save it off as a TIFF file, and that's good if you wanna bring it into another program like GIMP or, or Photoshop for some final fixes. Um, but we're gonna call this done, and so I'm just gonna save it as a JPEG. And I'll go ahead and increase the quality to 100. Okay, and then here's our final result um, out of PixInsight. This is my final video in this uh, Lagoon No Tracker series, so I can now sort of evaluate the different uh, pictures we've produced. I have to say, um, without doing any color calibration, I think that the stars and colors in the PixInsight version are just really good. Um, I didn't really have to do anything with it. Um, and I think it also did a pretty good job of retaining detail. I didn't try any noise reduction, which um, I think is, is good for this image. I don't think it can really hold up to much noise reduction. I think that was actually a mistake when I um, did it in Photoshop uh, because there is, there is this is the stock DSLR, if I haven't said that, and there is quite a bit of detail. You can see the cluster in the core of the lagoon and you can see um, sort of the lobes of the lagoon and how it's more bluish in the middle and, and then it is pink towards the edges. I just think everything came out really nicely in this um, PixInsight version. So for me, PixInsight is still really um, the best processing software for astro images that I have. Uh, I understand why some people though don't wanna buy it because it is a bit expensive, but um, to me it is, it is worth having in my toolkit. So this has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can always leave uh, questions and comments uh, below. And uh, till next time, clear skies. <laughs>